Uh, and today we're going to talk about money and financial beliefs, and it's a very important topic. You know, as some people tell me they're religious and they go to church every Sunday. And some people are religious and they go to church maybe once a year or once every couple of years. Funerals, weddings. And today we're going to talk about wealth. And that's important because some of us have certain beliefs about wealth and we do it every day. And some of us have beliefs about wealth and we do it once a year. It's called a tax return. So just like people do their religion perhaps daily or on special occasions, we can look at wealth the same way. Do we do wealth daily, weekly, yearly, or by the decade? So we're going to be talking a little bit about that and figuring out some of your beliefs. And today, I don't need to know any of your beliefs. This will be up to you. I'll give you some clues, some direction, and then I hope you can go down that direction maybe 10 seconds, maybe a few minutes and down that direction and contemplate the question or contemplate what's being shared and to really get the most out of it, probably want a piece of paper. Actually, kind of need a piece of paper. If you just do it by listening because you're in a taxi or something, that's what you got. For those of you that have beautiful red notepads, congratulations, and the black ones are okay as well. So before we get started, as usual, we, will, we want a really good why, a why that captures us, a why that really captures us and, you know, gets us hooked. So question, how many... How many hours a week are you doing stuff that you don't enjoy? And you want to write that down. How many hours per week are you doing stuff you don't enjoy? Monday morning, Monday lunch, Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. How many hours per week are you doing stuff that you're not enjoying? Now, how many hours a week do you spend maybe a little bit worried, maybe thinking about, you know, your purpose in life, maybe thinking about, you know, how am I going to make the rent? Maybe, you know, am I in the right job or do I need to change something? Could be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. It could be half an hour there, half an hour there. But how many hours a week do you spend wondering, perhaps worrying about those things? As we go, it's cool if you use a chat window. I love seeing stuff in the chat window. These numbers we want to write down for ourselves. You can write them down in the chat window as well. Now, it is important that we actually write these numbers down and as well if you're working with other people. Okay, wonderful, guys.
Now, what's your hourly rate? Not as a coach getting, you know, beautiful dollars, although you could use that. What's kind of your hourly rate? You know, a lot of coaches, I end up doing one, two, or maybe three sessions a day, you know, and that ends up being maybe a couple hundred dollars for the day. So, you know, you could divide that by hour, or maybe, you know, maybe you earn um, 30 in your currency, 30 per hour, and you work eight hours a day and you get 30 per hour. So what's, what's your hourly rate? What is your rough hourly rate? You're going to love this. What is your rough hourly rate? Okay, so that's your rough hourly rate and you know how many hours per week you're spending in the job and how many hours a week you spend worrying. So let's add up. Add up how many hours a week in the work or doing things that aren't satisfying and how many hours a week worrying. Times that by 52, 52 weeks in a year. So time's up by 52 weeks in a year. And you are doing fantastic. Please keep doing those mathematics. So we're calculating how many hours a year we end up doing stuff we don't like or worrying, how much per year. How much is that for 10 years? Great news, if you're not a mathematician, for 10 years, you just have to add an extra zero to it. Glad I got a couple of smiles there. So we need a couple of cameras on so I can see. Okay, now if you like to, you might have a big number in front of you and that's how much time you spend unnecessarily. And if you want to multiply that by the hourly rate, if you want to multiply that by your hourly rate, you might have a bit of an idea on the financial costs associated with not being rich. With not being rich. And yes, I say that bluntly. Rich to different people have different meanings. But I want you to be aware of those numbers. And most of you guys are coaches, so you know that that kind of stuff can be motivating. That can be a strong away from motivation. So we can use a strong away from motivation to start the session and start the ball rolling. Now, it might not feel comfortable, and honestly, I hope it doesn't, because it shouldn't. Now let's use that motivation to, to light up, light up the room like a torch or light up the room like a flashlight and see if there are some things in the room, in the mental room that's slowing us down. So by the end of today's session, I guarantee there should be a few light bulbs going on, on different things that can clear the way. Uh, I believe being wealthy is the same as being healthy. I believe it's our natural birthright. 
And honestly, it's 2021. It's 2021. It, it should not be that hard for the human race to create enough. It shouldn't be that hard for the human race to create enough. You know, hundreds of years ago, they used to produce farms using just bare hands and animals, and they were able to produce enough food to live. It's 2021. We have all kinds of advanced tools, machinery, and all kinds of breakthroughs. For sure, we shouldn't have to work huge hours to create enough food and shelter to sustain us. The thing is, some things have gone perhaps wrong in our society. And what has happened, perhaps the same thing happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago, perhaps thousands of years ago, perhaps the same thing happened there. The majority of people around the world in all cultures end up perhaps like building pyramids or, uh, you know, harvesting fruit, we end up working huge amounts of time, but really we shouldn't have to. Being wealthy, being healthy should be natural. So to be healthy, we've got to do some things. What do we have to do to be healthy? Now, I'd love for you guys to turn your microphones off, shout out a few things. What do we have to do to be healthy? Eat well and exercise. Eat well and exercise. Turn off the news. <laughs> Feed your soul as well. Feed your soul as well. Be surrounded people with same mindset. <laughs> yeah, Carl. Yeah. Jay, you're on the edge there. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a little bit mind-boggling to actually think of that, but um, I just sort of lost it thinking about family, thinking about love, thinking about everything. My mind just expanded and exploded. Great, great. Now, I'm going to give you guys the option. I'll give you guys a lot of options. You know, NLP is all about increasing options and choices, so I want to give you the choices. But there are some things that I want to put forward as well. And I like to put forward the belief that wealthy is the same as healthy. I like to put forward the belief that we all deserve it. It's up to you if you want to take that belief and claim it as your own. Uh, I think that or something like that is very useful. We would like, if we, if we believe that being wealthy is natural and healthy, it's going to be easier. But... Things stand in the way sometimes, like some people believe or some of our society, some of our society believes that being wealthy is not healthy. Some of our society believes that if you're rich, you must be an asshole. I mean, uh, a, uh, you must be a hole in the ground. And I don't... Awkward. <laughs> I enjoyed watching your reaction when you realized that, Adrian. I, I don't believe that being wealthy means you have to be a bad person, but some people genuinely believe that and they have beliefs like that. So in this session, we want to get some of that stuff up to the surface. So when we bring that stuff up, your mind is going to be more ready to catch it now. See, by digging into some of the pain around how many hours, your brain now is more open to catch any kind of breakthrough that comes. Makes sense, right? We've got to prime the brain. We've got to pre-frame. So we're going to pre-frame that we're going to have valuable content, but that whole exercise about writing down the hours pre-frames your brain or opens up the loops to grab a hold of information. Now, I think just about everyone now has seen um, neurological levels or this much understanding we have our identity and underneath our identity who we are we have our values and we have our beliefs 
from neurological levels. Everyone should have understanding of this. Above our identity, we might have spirituality. This is courtesy of Robert Diltz. And there's more below, but I've just kind of cut off the bottom bit, okay? So we have our identity. Hi, I'm Adrian, blah, 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 blah. You know, or, hi, I'm Matthew, I'm so-and-so. We all have our identity. And uh, my identity, I have a, a value for wealth and health like everyone does. So I value my health, I value my wealth, I value my family, I value my time, and so do all of us. But we value them in various degrees. Some people have a higher value for wealth, especially when the money's empty. And some people have a higher value for health, especially when it's empty or broken. Interesting, hey? It's like the lack of creates, but not always. So we have our identity and we have different values. And if I had a very, very strong value for wealth all the time, all the time, you know, I might be out there selling, 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 hustling, 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 or really, really focused on money. But I don't, and no one really does. You know, we have a high value for wealth, maybe, but we have a high value for other things. Now, if we have a really high value for wealth and we have very, very low value for community, community or other people, we might end up being very selfish. If we have a very high value for wealth and we don't value family, we don't value friends, we don't value contribution, we don't value community, we might end up hoarding all the wealth. Yeah? And throw a couple of things on top, we could end up being real holes. But if we have a high value for wealth, and a really high value for community, we could earn and share, earn and share, earn and share, couldn't we? Like a, how do you, what's that, Phil, Phil, Phil in? What are those people that make a lot of money and they give a lot of it away? Philanthropist. Lovely. Now, some of them might do it like they make a hundred million and they give a million dollars away when the camera is looking as a marketing gimmick. But we can also be wealthy, get a lot of money, and we can be sharing it with our family in our communities and making a big difference. Just because someone has a higher value for wealth doesn't mean they're a whole. They're a whole if they don't really share it or care about their family and communities. Something, Can I something. Say something? Like yeah, Carla. There's also people that has a lot of money and give donations anonymously. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So just because someone makes a lot and you don't see them giving it away doesn't mean they're not giving it away. So a whole pile of stuff goes on inside our heads. So in Carla's example, which is wonderful, you might have a, a neighbor down the street who, loves, who lives in a mansion and he drives a Ferrari, maybe two Ferraris, one for Friday, one for Saturday, right? And people say, oh, he's a, he's a, he's a wealthy hole. You know, he takes all the money, but what they, they might not know, he gives so much away discreetly. By the way, Motivate gives to, to Lifeline. I don't even think we promote it now. We just, just do it. So people can think, think that wealthy people are bad when they are, can actually be the most generous. Now, if you had more wealth, what would that mean for your family? Take a moment to consider that. If you had more wealth, what would that mean for your family? Some people get scared right here. And some people get excited. If you find yourself getting scared at any moment, make sure you write it down. That's a great thing to change. 
some people really get worried because if I get wealthy, my family won't accept me or my family will think something, something, or they'll want, they'll want to use me for something, something. In fact, this is probably a really good time to actually look for, to actually look for some of those unresourceful or limiting beliefs. Is there anything negative associated with being wealthy for you? If you're wealthy, any, any problems with that? Now, I'm actually hoping I'm going to get some more yeses. And if you get a yes for it, you want to write the belief down. Use tonight's session to find any beliefs that might be unresourceful. Don't worry about changing it now. You might just change it automatically later on tonight. Take this as your opportunity to go looking for potential beliefs. Okay, so a lot of people say their family won't accept them or they're going to have with family or family dinners, family barbecues or old uncle or auntie. Yeah, some people also think about friends. They're worried about losing friends or what their friends will think, what their friends will say. They're worried about partners. Okay, so you want to find any unresourceful beliefs you want to find and write down. And now we've already gone from our values down a bit to our belief system. One of the common ways I like to teach this is our identity. And around our identity is our values. And around each value is our belief system. So around each value is a belief system. And tonight we can look at being rich as a value or being wealthy. I couldn't quite decide, so it's up to you. Sometimes I also write in there, successful. I look at the value of success and I look at the belief system around success. And then I might look at the belief of, oh, sorry, I might look at the value of being healthy and look at the belief system around that. So you can pick wealthy, you can pick feeling rich, you could pick feeling successful. And we're going to be looking for all the beliefs around it. And I, ideally, I think we want to find beliefs that support us and push us forward to creating more. For those that missed it before, I want to repeat again. Some people believe in religion and go to church every week. Some people believe in religion and they go on weddings and funerals. What kind of financial beliefs do you want? Ones that have you driving forward each week or ones that have you driving forward at weddings and funerals? Okay, I'm going to take a moment to check out this excellent chat window.
just going to briefly address uh, what Alicia said about Motivate Lifeline. Uh, I, I think maybe five years ago, Motivate started, we, we used to put on our flyers and banners, we were giving 10% uh, or something to, to Lifeline. And uh, I don't really care if people thought it was a marketing gimmick or what. But what actually happened was within months, within like two months, lots of other little organizations around Shanghai, they started they started giving donations away as well. And I kind of believe that when we create more wealth and we demonstrate to our family and our community generosity with our time or wealth, it has a flow on effect. It has a flow on effect. And I'd love to see our community and communities around the world be more generous, especially when things like COVID happens. Because COVID happens, or in my case, in North Queens, and we have cyclones and a lot of people go out there and they get food and they, they come home and they hoard food at home and they end up with like stashes of food at home and they kind of hoard it. And then maybe six months later, half the food's expired. I think one of the biggest things that could have happened in COVID, one of the biggest things that could have happened in COVID is people could have made close relationships with their neighbors. And they could have been sharing resources with their neighbors and checking on their neighbors. So the more we can adopt the abundance mindset, the more chance we have of a global change. Yolanda pointed out something wonderful, although it's a bit scary, also to be judged by family. She's pointed out in the chat window that she worries, you know, it, it must be a lot, she wants to have a lot of wealth so she can share it with her family, but then she might get judged by the family and others because she has money. It's more like, like when I have money, I want, I would need to have so much money that I can make sure that my whole, like my family is also well off because I feel like as much as more actually there is this kind of financial uh, difference between me and uh, my parents, for example, as harder for me, it is actually to, um, accept that I'm better off than them and that comes back to deserving so this is kind of a dynamic um, I'm struggling with a lot also being a public figure or maybe wanting to become more and more a public uh, figure and so when you do that and the distance get bigger and bigger I guess like that it also reflects back a little bit on you so hmm. I'm a little bit in this deserving thing as well like why should i deserve better than my parents for example um thank yeah. you for sharing yolanda really really worth having a look at later thank you very much for sharing and uh perhaps similar but different and maybe completely different and you also shared that to be rich as a value feels bad. Now, if being rich feels bad, that's like a, <laughs> let's get the torch in there. If being wealthy or rich or any of that feels bad, we wanna get the torch in there and have a bit of a look. And one way I look at rich, and I'm, I'm really comfortable with the word rich. I wasn't before. I wasn't before. I completely wasn't before, okay? Completely wasn't. But the way I look at rich, it's like rich is like, for me, it's like strong chocolate, like the 80% chocolate, rich, dark chocolate. That's how I consider rich, like rich, dark chocolate. Not that, you know, sugar-filled stuff. <laughs> See, Matthew, I'm watching. Not that sugar-filled chocolate, like the rich, dark chocolate. I wasn't going to sweat. <laughs> so the way I consider rich is like rich, dark, it's like dark chocolate. It's like this rich is like, for me, rich is like kind of like pure. 
I had to change my definition. But guess what? It's up to you to choose your own definition. It's up to you to choose your own definition. And you can choose your own definition. Now, if part of you wants to be and part of you doesn't want to be, you've got like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and you've got like half the reindeers pulling off to the left, the other half pulling off to the right, Santa's screwed. We've got to get everything aligned whether you want to say left hemisphere, right hemisphere, or conscious, unconscious, higher conscious, the more aligned we get, the easier it is to go. So if we have misalignment and pulls, it's going to really slow us down. Uh, Angie, I'm glad you like the chocolate metaphor, and I'd like to encourage you to take it further. Take it further and make it yours. Hey, Carla, can you share that thing you just shared? How did that start? What do what you mean? My message? Yeah. The, the, yes. Okay. When the corona arrived, it was a panic over, all over the world, of course. Everybody has families. I have family also in other places. So and people at the, start, in the beginning started panicking about food. And there was a long queues on the shops. I think it was everywhere like that. But uh, at least here, uh, there were, the people were correct. They were waiting and understanding what's going on and be patient if they're afraid. And believe that uh, the government here was protecting uh, and uh, will keep uh, us uh, with enough food for us. <laughs> it was crazy. And then uh, people start to get tired this year, second year. And uh, they start to creating see around if there is the land that was not cultivated. Ask the owners if they want us to clean or to make it uh, to can be used for a good use, and use their water too, and they allow it. And it's a way of also to help them to keep the land clean. And uh, we have the vegetables, uh, bio vegetables without pesticides and anything. So, and when it's in excess, sometimes we give the restaurants here and uh, who wants it? And it's like that. First is for who's working there on the land. And it's in excess, we give it away like that. It just takes someone to start it. You know, you could be the person that starts the ball rolling you could possibly you could be the person that has the land and says hey i've got some land you guys can use it or you could be the person saying hey i've got some resource let's share it and we all have resources and we also have our internal resources as well so we all have resources which we can share. So we want to be more and more abundant to share that. I love the idea that the, fam the communities can just get together and start making that happen and they can do much more. It doesn't have to stop there. It can keep going. Can I say something a little more? So, sorry. That also helped the people around to have less fear and the community start to get stronger and trust each other and the, the ambience changed it really. It was nicer. Yeah, thank you. I remember making a decision about nine or so years ago. I was looking at what to do next with my life. Do I do I go and like go to the United States and buy property? At that time, it was a, a property boom was starting. Uh, and I had the opportunity to go over there and buy property. And then I also saw some other ways to, to make money quite easily, you know, coming out of the, uh, the GFC. And uh, I thought about in future when I have kids. So if I have kids, I could, if I had extra money, I could give it to the schools and it really didn't feel right. 
I thought, you know, it would be really good to share knowledge. Knowledge. Or maybe my time. Maybe your time. Maybe in times when there's a food, there's a, there's a, a real risk of a lack of food rather than, okay, well, I got some money. Well, honestly, if you were like that, and it wasn't just Switzerland, there's a lot of places where there was a big concern about food shortage, Asia as well as Europe. So you can, you can, you got spare money, but there's no more food. Well, what if you can donate your time? But I'm sorry, it's going to be very hard to donate your time if you're doing work you don't like. It'll be very hard to donate and give time and knowledge if you're stuck in a job you don't like. That's why I think it's so important to be wealthy because you don't have to have like a Ferrari, you don't. But if you can have your bases covered, then when there's a crisis, you could give your time and knowledge. So being wealthy to me doesn't, oh, another word I like to use is financially free. Financially free. Your rent's covered. Your bills are covered. It doesn't matter how much you make this week, the bills are covered. Therefore, you can afford to do something really crazy like start a coaching business or a training business. Now, if you're financially free like that, then you can, instead of being giving away money, like a rich Uncle Sam, you can be going away and you can actually go and help your neighbors with your time. That sort of freedom. So perhaps, perhaps, perhaps before, perhaps before your definition of wealthy, rich, or a successful person of a business, maybe before it had these kind of things about a person that didn't give away time. Maybe before your definition of wealthy and rich meant arrogant or stuff. But I hope that moving forward, you can update your definition. And maybe the definition doesn't mean millions, or maybe it means you can give. You can give. Maybe it means you can share. So who are you? Who are you? What do you value? What are your beliefs? And what you believe will lead to your actions and your results. And I heard this cool thing from a little girl once. She said, practice is the price you pay. I can't remember how the rest of it went. Practice is the price you pay. See you later. Practice is the price you pay. To think and act a certain way. What? She's being, she's being shy. <laughs> Practice is the price you pay. To, to think and act a certain way. Practice is the price you pay to think and act a certain way. Is that right? Now, this little lady up here was in a, a sports or a cross-country race, uh, I believe, nine days ago. And, and this little lady thought that she could come uh, maybe second, maybe second. So she was planning or kind of hoping that she would come maybe second. And her daddy there was talking to her before the race. And what did her daddy say to her? Why second? And she said, because I can't imagine coming first. So we practiced imagining. And then, <laughs> and what happened? And then she beat everybody by about 200 meters. And it was awesome. <laughs> And we're still smiling for it. <laughs> so she had a whole belief system saying that she could come second. And just prior to the race, her daddy said, well, why not? Why not aim for first kind of thing? Changed her belief system, had her imagining she was coming first, and then she won. Right? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. 
And that's not limited to kids. Yeah, she's more advanced than me. Wow. You should teach me. Wow. <laughs> Great. Well done. Get it, girl. Thank you. Thank you. So to get the results and the actions and the results, we need to change our beliefs. We need to change up here to change down there. We need to make sure we, we changing our belief system is the most important thing. We need to update our belief system and we can, there is no age limit to it. So the next part is a matter of finding. This is a torch, by the way. Okay, like a torch, we, we want to find the torch. Guys, would it be cool if I gave you uh, some short statements and you can have a bit of a think and maybe you can give yourself a score? Okay, wonderful. I have some beliefs for you. And apologies, I'm taking them out of, uh, of something I wrote before and I'm going to change them a little bit. Okay, um, I create my life. Okay, so I create my life on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being completely believe. 10 being completely believed, one being no. Maybe five is like, eh. I create my life. One to 10. Okay, secondly, life happens to me. Life happens to me. What is this referring to? Because life is happening to us all. It's just what it is. <laughs> Sounds like a 10 there. No, 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 no. But I don't believe that things just... I think things happen for a reason, but not that That's I'm a victim idea. of it. So is it a victim question or is this a... Oh, it uh, is a little bit, perhaps. You could consider it a little bit, perhaps. perhaps. Spiritual. Anyway, anyway, don't worry too much. Don't dig in too much. But uh, some will be more obvious and some are not. But anyway, you just got to get a feel for it. Do you play the game of money to win? Or I play the game of money to win? 10, total believe I play the game of money to win. And if someone scored low in that, that's okay. Remind me, remind me later on. Golden Seed, I saw your reaction. Um, okay. If any, it's an interesting thing, the word win. What does win mean? Can you say it again, the question? I play the game of money to win. In the game of money, I play to win. In the game of money, I play to win. Now, for me, it's a 10. Yep. By me winning, it doesn't mean I have and you don't. By me winning, it doesn't mean I have and the community doesn't. For me, winning means I have and my community has. So my definition of winning, I updated some time ago. By me winning in money, I can give more away. So if you had a, a very low score for that, you might want to consider what winning means to you. Just like that little girl there, before she considered winning maybe coming second, but after talking to her daddy, she considered winning coming first. And it's okay if we set up the goal that winning means we pay off our car, then that's the goal post. That's the goal post we set. And the thing is, the next one. I play the game of money not to lose. Uh, 
I play the game of money not to lose. Just write down your score. We'll come back to it. <sighs> How many deletions in this question? What? Lose what? Yeah, yeah. And you, fill in the, you fill in the blanks yourself. I'm committed to being rich. I am committed to being rich. There's no right or wrong. I'm committed to being rich. And I think I'm rich like dark chocolate. I think big. I think big. I focus on opportunities. I focus on opportunities. I admire other rich and successful people. I admire other rich and successful people. I associate with positive, successful people. I associate with positive, successful people. I associate with negative, unsuccessful people. What means associate? I mean, I could Google it, but is it like um, identify? Yeah. Or connect? Identify, oh. connect. And we're going to go over these. After we go through, we'll go over them, but you just want to write out the score now. We'll go over it because perhaps you do associate a lot with negative, unsuccessful people and you coach them. And if most of your time being social, if you're being social, you've got social time and you're hanging out with people that are negative and unsuccessful, obviously they'll say something about it. I'm willing to promote myself and my values. I am willing to promote myself and my value. I promote I'm happy to promote myself and my values. I am bigger, I am bigger than my problems. As in, you know, my problems are smaller than me. I'm bigger than my problems. I I am an excellent receiver. I am an excellent receiver. Receiver, you know, that's like your ability to, you know, receive. Sometimes people give you gifts, give you chocolate, maybe give you money, and you're like, okay. Because some people get paid money, especially for those starting out as coaches, therapists, and stuff. Sometimes people will go to give you money, and, and you're like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. And that's okay. But sometimes we need to pay our bills and people are offering us money and we're like, no, 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 no. So I am an excellent receiver. I'm really open to receiving. It's really easy to receive. It's easy for people to pay me. 
it's easy for people to give. Um, it's easy for me to go, okay, thank you. I choose to get paid based on results. This is one for the English teachers or those doing teaching to mark. I choose to get paid based on results. I choose to get paid based on time. Sometimes there's a situation in life where, you know, you could have the front seat, but you got to pay extra or you can have the back seat and you get something else. And some people think I have to have that or that. I have to have that or that. That or that. I have to have my health or wealth. I have to have that or that. Do you find yourself thinking I have to have that or that? And in the very same situation, some people believe I can have both. I can have both. Or how can I have both? I want my cake and the cherry on top. And I'm going to eat it too. I'll never forget working with this guy. He was about to make his first kind of million and he had the belief that I, I can't, I can have that or that. And I, I was talking to him about, well, you can have that or that. That's great. Yeah, you can have that. You can have that. What if you have both? He's like, oh, no, no, no. I can't have both. And this gentleman was about to make his first million US dollars. And uh, I'm like, well, what if you were to have that and that? What if you were to have your cake and eat it too? And he's like, after a while, he started to think, well, what if I did? What if I could have both? So you might have picked up there that by thinking, how can I have both could possibly be a better or a higher belief than either or. And you could also for the NLPs, we could also think about this as meta programs, a meta program of either or, or a meta program of a one at all, or a meta program for opportunity. But this isn't from NLP. I, I scraped this from somewhere else and I, I used it and refined it. I, I believe I manage and focus on my net worth. I manage and focus on my net worth. Score from one to 10, I manage and focus on my net wealth. Oh, my net wealth, my net worth. Put a little mark here. Do you know your net worth? If you died now, if you died now and someone else came and sold all your stuff next week and paid all your bills, paid out your student loan, whatever, how much money is left, if any, that is your net wealth or your net worth. So I manage and focus on my net wealth. Uh, for me, that's a 10, but not for everybody. 
For what do you want to manage that? I manage and focus on it. Like markets go up and down, money comes in and out. I keep a focus on my overall net wealth. Oh. And for those that are really money-minded, one thing that is lacking in books like Robert Kiyosaki or the, the, the wealth books, one thing that is missing in a lot of the wealth books is that sometimes we take money out of our bank account and we spend it on our education or we spend it on our EQ. And that means it's out of the financial spreadsheets and our financial, financial wealth comes down. But our overall net worth goes up. But you'll never learn that if you're reading the Rich Dad books or that kind of stuff. They don't know about it in general. I manage and focus on my working income. I manage and focus on my working income. I believe I manage my money well. I believe I manage my money well. Uh, too fast on those last two. Can you, can you repeat those last two? Okay, the last two was I manage and focus on my working income. And then afterwards was that... Um, I manage my money well. The thing about that is, I remember having an IE, that's like an, uh, a helper, a helper. And, and uh, I thought, oh, my helper, she could make so much more money. But my helper was so busy running from job to job to job. She would come to my house and work for two hours or four hours, and then she would leave and race away to another job. And I would happily pay her double if she would stay around and do a little bit extra. Oh, I had an abundance of money to give to her if she could give me more help, but she was too busy. I remember having another helper down in uh, Kunming, right? And she would turn up a little bit late and she would try to go early. And I wanted to double her time. But she really wanted to run away and get up to another job. And I was just like, God, if, if this lady focused, if she focused a bit more on her net worth, we could have spoken about it and increased her pay and she could have just focused more on, that, on our work. She could have had an, a higher hourly rate and had extra hours. But she was so busy running from job to job to job to job. And we see this a lot. You see this a lot, don't you? You talk to people about coaching and they're running from job to job or they're running from here to there. They're so busy on their hourly rate or getting to the next job that they don't take, as, they don't take the time to focus on the big picture. It's important we step back and look at the big picture. Do we want to be running from job to job to job to job? If we do, great. But on the, the IE, she didn't really want to go job to job to job to job so fast. She just didn't take the time to step back and look at the big picture or look at her net wealth and look at the opportunities which were in front of her. But that's an IE. I act, I act in spite of fear. Fear, fear of what? Losing money or what? Yeah. My act inspired a fear of standing up and public speaking. There's another saying, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I'm not quite sure how true that is, you know. So I act in spite of fear. That can also be a problem for some people. 
I got out of the I got out of the crypto market because it was crashing, and then it crashed down a lot. And a friend said, "Quick, uh, get back in. You know, it, it's about to hit the bottom and bounce up. Get back in." And I and I came up to to my workstation and I was looking at it and I was almost going to get back in. I felt fear and I, I've taught myself feel the fear and do it anyway. So I felt the fear and I was about to do it anyway. And I'm like, just stop, <laughs> stop, stop, step back. But you know, I did a little meditation and I was like, no. So I act very easily in spite of fear. From my history, I'm pretty used to confronting fear, but sometimes it's a problem. Sometimes we need to slow down in this fear, but a lot of people, perhaps a majority of people are less likely to invest because of fear. Also with things like stock market, property markets, a lot of people don't take action because of fear. And sometimes they take action and it's too late. Uh, for example, just look at the recent crypto market, right? It's been going up like since November and a month ago it stopped. A month ago it stopped and last week it went down. So it's been going like that since November, since November. And a lot of people got in in April so they, they weren't getting in, they weren't getting in, they weren't. But after enough times, they got convinced and they hopped in and it was too late. I say this because my bloody big sister did the same thing. But it wasn't crypto, it was a property market and the stock market. I was making money in the stock market, I think back in 2000 or something. And then, you know, it went up and up and up and up. And then my sister got in and it went boom. <laughs> I was making money in property market. It got up and up. There, and then my sister got in. It was like, boom. <laughs> like sometimes people wait too long. So because of the fear, they wait and they wait. And then some people get in too quick. It's really good to be aware of, do we act in spite of fear? Or how, how do we act when there's fear? How do we act when there's fear? Okay, there's a couple more, and this is this comes from an assessment tool that I, I made up. But I'm gonna pause there, and there's I've got one or two more beliefs, but I'll, I'll stop there, and I want to jump back into the start and review some of them. So in these answers, you know, there's no right or wrong. We just want to use this like a flashlight. I've got an assessment online and I'll share the quiz with you in the chat room. This is where the questions came from, but I've changed them a little bit. So if you want to go back over this or take someone over it, you can use this as a test and hell, you guys can even copy it. You won't find this anywhere. Uh, actually, if you do find it anywhere, let me know they've copied it. Um, this originally came from some psychase and coaching and some other resources. I've compiled it together and I've tested this for a whole pile of people. The very first question I have in this kind of psychometric tool is rich people believe I create my life. Poor people believe life happens to me. So people that believe strongly that I create my life that tends to be a belief that leads us more to creating it. Now, you guys may not have created COVID, but if you weren't alive, it wouldn't be COVID. I remember I was in Shanghai walking down the street and there was a storm and I had my umbrella. And I had to think, how did I create the storm? And I realized, bloody hell, I'm from North Queensland. Wouldn't be a storm if I was at home. <laughs> there wouldn't be a storm if I was at home. So I could take responsibility for the storm. So those that are more successful tend to take full responsibility and create their life rather than being at the victim end. And I think most of us have heard this enough times. Tony Robbins, one of the biggest things they do at the Tony Robbins webinars is move people from being a victim to being in charge. So those that believe life happens to them, tends to be a lower performing belief. 
Rich people tend to play the game of money. They play the game of money to win. But what does winning mean? So I would like to suggest, I would like to suggest that play the game to win. But define what win means to you. Win doesn't have to mean you become a whole, an a-hole. Winning could mean you become a person that shares generosity. Rich people play the game of money to win. Poor people play the game of money not to lose. So the not to lose is more of a poorer belief. And if you do hear Tony Robbins, oh, Tony Robbins does say a lot of the time, Tony Robbins will say that I will not be poor again. So you could also see that as a meta program of away. Tony has a large away from motivation. Tony doesn't say I had a dream to be a multi whatever it was. Tony had a goal not to lose the game. But I'd like to suggest that we focus on, on winning the game. And as soon as you win more, your coaching and training business will go up. You'll be able to share more. Rich people think bigger picture. We covered this in a lot of our training. Those that think bigger picture tend to earn more. Those that think smaller picture seem to work on smaller pictures. Let's say you can help 10 people, great. But what if you could help 10 presidents? That's a much bigger picture. So we might want to chunk up and take on bigger pictures. Focusing on opportunities brings more abundance. It's pretty obvious. So the more we focus on opportunities, the more likely we are to create wealth. Rich people, successful people tend to admire other rich and successful people. So when we see people that are really successful, it is cool to admire them. It's totally fine to admire them. I suggest admiring them and maybe even saying, hey, that's, that's really cool. Well done. Some, it's a rather poor belief to resent rich or resent successful. If we resent successful people, what does that say about ourselves? Uh, Australia, we've got a thing called tall poppy syndrome. Jay, you want to fill us in? What's tall poppy syndrome? So tall poppy syndrome is actually the system that started on the ships out from England where if anybody stuck their head up, the whole lot would be punished. So therefore the masses made sure that nobody got up above them. That's the originality of where it came from for Australia. So when people are too successful in Australia, we like to talk, take their yeah. head off. And it's not just Australia. This is, this is common around the place, isn't it? It's, it's, it's really silly, isn't it? It's really kind of silly. But think, though, if you want to control a ship full of people, people, if you want to control a ship full of people, tall poppy syndrome is what you want. I'm not saying anyone wants to control a, a ship full of people. I mean, who on earth would really want to control a mass of people? And there's an inherent belief system that happens is that if someone is getting something more than us, then they're taking it from what we should be getting. Which is sad. And which is also an economic fallacy. Yeah. Which is, you know, so it's not only an incorrect belief, but intellectually it's not. Not correct. Okay, next plea for long. I asked about associating with positive, successful people. Are we associating with positive, successful people? I hope the more we can, the better. But you'll also find, you'll also find that whenever you find the millionaires, particularly multi-millionaires, they're generally they're scarce straight up. They're like less than three, four percent of the population, so they're scarce. And out of those three, four percent of the population, I'm talking financially successful. Okay, so out of the population, the three or four percent that manage to make the multi-millions, right? There are a limited part, and how many of them are actually like 
you know, friendly and approachable and whatnot, you're looking at a smaller number. They also know that they've got to be scarce with their time. And maybe it's because they're scarce with their time and they're giving it to their family and their business. Yeah. So it can be hard finding and hanging out with these people that are, you know, have a high, have high levels of success. They can be hard. A lot of people, when it comes to mentors, coaches and stuff, they, they pay good money to, to have that kind of association with the, the positive, successful people. I, I, I had on my Facebook some of our training and I had some friends from high school, you know, trying to come in and trying to meet me and stuff. And some of them, I, I saw some of their pictures on social media. Some of them had the cops in the background, you know, one was on a fishing boat and the, the police were going through their boat, you know, and I'm like, I don't really want to spend time with some of those people yet there's another friend who may join one of our future trainings you know he um he will hopefully come on our training or when he does you'll understand uh, absolutely wonderful person it's just the intellectual background of their family is rather low so he has successful mindset coming up but his whole family has been really holding him back so i go and spend time with him and say come on Come out of there and come into our training. We'll look after you. So you can still hang out with negative or unsuccessful people, but what are you doing with them? Are you going out to hang out with them to feel good? There's an unwritten law here about the law of comparison. We know everything by comparing. You know what's here 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 by comparing. You're comparing what's here and what's not here. So we're constantly comparing. When we compare ourselves to people that have done more than us, we may feel smaller. If we spend a lot of time to people below us, we may feel bigger. Yeah? Hang out with a pile of dwarfs, you'll feel tall. Hang out with a pile of NBA players, you'll feel short. I notice a couple of people that run one of the local churches, I constantly see them with people from their church. And I know, I know a couple of these priest pastors, they have like multiple, you know, have like 12 properties around town. And I was always seeing them with some of the, like the lower socioeconomic. And I kept, kept seeing it. I kept seeing it. I kept seeing it. And I was wondering, why aren't they hanging out with people that live up the hill instead of at the bottom of the hill? And I remember I, I spent months, months traveling with priests around uh, East Timor, Afghanistan, and the Philippines. Uh, and I was wondering about that law of comparison. It's a lot more comfortable hanging out with people that are less successful than us and uncomfortable hanging out with people that are more successful. Where does the growth happen? In the comfort zone or out of the comfort zone? I mentioned I am willing to promote myself and my value. Are you willing to promote yourself and your value? I think that's a very important thing to have high. Rich people are willing to promote themselves and their values. I don't see every rich person doing this. There's a fair few top dogs I know that don't. And by top dogs, I mean like the top dogs in my, uh, in my city, they don't promote themselves much. So I'm not 100% sure about that. But I think if we are comfortable in promoting ourselves in our value, yeah. All right, I don't understand. So rich people, they don't promote themselves they, because they don't want to be known they have that much money or it's they promote by to others no no the 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 work the work i've done shows that rich people are willing to promote themselves and their value poor people think low about selling and promotion i'm pretty sure now that poor people think low about selling. We can think highly about selling. Selling is a really respectable career. I mean, I'm selling my beliefs right now. 
a child, someone that someone that works in childcare is selling to the kids, is selling to the toddlers. Someone who's teaching English is is selling faith and belief that they can learn the language. It's just the way we perceive selling. And I've seen some wealthy people that will happily stand up and promote themselves and their values. And I've seen some really wealthy people that won't stand up. They won't really be public health. They will stay under the radar. But if you are willing to stand up and promote yourself, I think you might be more likely to create success. If you're willing to stand up and promote what you believe in, more people will buy your vision. The couple I know that do have like huge amounts of wealth and don't promote themselves because they're kind of like retired, they own tons of property, they're worried about liability. Yeah, but we are going to be selling our coaching business. We're going to be selling our values. You know, I believe in equality for all. You know, I, I believe in women's rights. I believe in men's rights. I believe in children's rights. I believe in vegetarian rights. <laughs> Yet people I think selling is bad. If we believe selling is bad, we're going to have a hard time selling our beliefs. And I believe you guys should be chasing your dreams. I really believe you should be chasing your dreams and be living life on your terms. So I really hope I can sell that. I want to sell you confidence in getting outside your comfort zone. I want to sell you the belief that you can step out and whether you win or fall over, I'll be here to help you up. I believe that we are bigger than our problems. We really do create our life. You'll be amazed how much we actually create through our thought. Thought, intention, but we need, you know, action and energy as well. Intention is one thing, but if all the manifestors out there, it's great to have your intention, but we need to back it up with energy. We want to be excellent receivers. Obviously, we want to be excellent receivers. We're bigger than our problems. We're excellent receivers. Poor people, oh, they say no. Sometimes people are afraid of money. I've seen some wonderful people start their career in coaching i've given them a client and i've said to them look charge this client give them a cheap price but charge this client and they often reply going no i haven't charged them and the thing is is that i've given them the client so that they can charge and get over that and i know the client won't get a great result if they don't pay because if the client is getting it for free the client's going to believe that with a student or an unprofessional I mean, who gets, who goes to see a psychologist for free? No one does, unless it's an intern. So if we do excess coaching for free, they're going to think you're not good enough or you're not professional. You haven't been trained. You haven't been certified. You haven't been whatever. Now, if you give them absolute dynamite, it won't go off because they think you're just a kid. Okay. Rich people choose to get paid based on results, not time. Results are more important, not time, not time. Results are more important, not time. In saying that, in saying that there's still, there's still an angle here because you might want to step back, look at your schedule and you might go, okay, I am going to load up. I'm going to load up my day with as much hourly work as I can. And with that money, I'm going to pay, pay a marketer and pay this and pay that and they're going to build my business. But it's really good to step back and look at the overall results. Don't get too trapped like the IE running from house to house. As we mentioned before, rich people think both. How can I have my cake and eat it too? And rich people definitely focus on their net worth. And they focus more on their net worth, not their cash flow. I was talking to a guy. He just got paid out $1 million US dollars. Uh, I think he already had maybe eight or so. And uh, he's like, oh, I had a great day. I've got a million dollar payout, uh, something finalized. And he says, it was a great day, but my wife's so pissed off. Why? Well, we were using that money. You see, I was getting $20,000 a month. And instead of getting $20,000 a month, I've got a million dollars now. 
Well, the twenty thousand dollars per month was covering their, I think, like their house and IE in Singapore, but now he's got a million dollars. So, well, the million dollars covers more than twenty dollars a month. He's like, I'm just going to put that into a new mine or something. But his wife was freaking out. His wife manages cash flow or income. He's a self-made man. He's always focused on net wealth. We had a great conversation about it, but he's totally focused on net wealth. The property, all the property guys I know, all the property guys, they're focused on net wealth, not cash flow. But there are times when you want to focus on cash flow and net wealth. You might want to measure both. If you don't know your net wealth, figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, message me. I'll send you a link to a file where we've got video spreadsheets and you can figure it out. If you know your net wealth, excellent. You're already rocking. You should be measuring it each month. If you want to make more money, check out your cash flow and see if you can measure your cash flow and your net wealth. If you manage both of them, you'll move faster. If you don't know your net wealth or your cash flow, I'm a bit scared. You don't really know. Imagine if you're going on a race and you don't know, you don't know what you ate before the race. If you're going on a race, you need to know your energy system. Now, obviously, I think I might have said rich people have their money working for them. I think I may have missed that actually. So once you're managing and focusing on creating your, web, your net wealth, you can obviously focus and manage your wealth well. And when you can money, when you can manage your wealth, you can then start having it working for you. And the more your money is working for you, you start to create bigger chunks. So the IE can make so much per hour, but once she has a couple of IEs working for her, she can then start to invest in things like marketing or more staff. If we're a coach working on an hourly rate, once we make more chunks of money, we could work on, we could have a house or two or three or four while we do coaching. Now, I make money coaching, but the money that comes in from property often supersedes it. it, it it's bigger than it because my money works hard for me. Rich people act in spite of fear. Poor people let fear stop them. So be really aware when you feel fear. And sometimes it's good to stop and look at the fear. There are a couple of people in this group who have really acted in spite of fear. We've got a couple of people that are leaving their jobs and stepping out despite the fear. They're stepping into full-time coaching and leaving their jobs behind them. That just, takes a lot of guts. Give an applause on that. That's um, succeed or fail. That's admirable. Well done. Well done. And uh, I think I said to them at the start, hang on, let's take a step back, have a look, you know, but, but they, they know what they're doing and they're going in full, full Monty. Uh, they're going in hard and they will succeed. Okay, so there's a whole pile of beliefs there around money. I, I hope that today's session for you, you've been able to shine the torch on a couple of things. Even if some of those things are the other way around, there's a chance you can still make it. I know some rich people, as I said, that don't share their values, that they kind of keep it hidden. Yeah. So I hope you have found, and I hope that you've been able to highlight a couple of things that you can change. As most of you are coaches, it is very easy to change your beliefs once you find them. The problem tends to be in finding them. Once you find them, it's so easy. You can reach out to any coach, preferably one of our NLP coaches because they will know. Yeah. And if you can't change any beliefs, just send me a voice message. We'll be able to change it. That's the biggest problem with beliefs. Once you can write it down, we can change it totally. We just got to be able to pinpoint where they are. I think we might have a video somewhere and I'll keep this very short because we're out of time. Uh, I have a video somewhere and in the middle we write something like wealth and around it, we write things around it like a definition 
uh, examples. What happens before and what does wealth lead to? We have this kind of model. Again, this comes from Robert Diltz. This is a, a really good model for uh, logical people on how to redefine our wealth. If you want to access that, let me know. I think we have this somewhere. But really simple, you get the value in the middle, the value in the middle, above the value, the definition. What does it mean? So you could write rich, for example, rich. What does rich mean? And you write out what rich means. What's your definition of rich? On the left side, what happens before it? What needs to happen? What needs to happen in order for you to be rich? What happens afterwards? Because some people believe that, some people believe that afterwards I'm gonna be an asshole. I can say that little girl's gone. So if we believe gonna be an a-hole for rich, that's a wealth that we need to change. Okay, so definition, what happens before, what happens after? And the last one are examples. What are examples of rich? What are examples of rich? Um, I can pay my rent. A lot of people have it like this. I can pay my rent and I can feel good about myself. And blah, 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 blah. And make a note of this. Make a note of this. You don't want and. You don't want and. That's a killer. You don't want and. You want or. Or. So what this actually means is wealth means this. Before wealth, that happens. After wealth happens. And examples of wealth are I can pay my rent easily or I can buy a new toy or I can go on a holiday or this or that. And the reason being is when any of these examples or that example or that example or that example, when any of those examples are fulfilled, we will feel wealthy and we will be motivated, motivated to get more. When we use the AND symbol, you could possibly use AND instead. The AND would set up a feedback loop like this, but it might not feel nice. Because, you know, I've paid my rent and I've done that, but I don't feel good because I haven't flown around the world in a helicopter. And some people set up the ANDs. That can set you up on a loop which doesn't feel good. If we have an OR, it can feel good, and it can feel good, and it can feel good. Yep. Yolanda? Um, what is like, I mean, the or is, is very nice, so it's uh, very important. But like my initial feeling was like, again, uh, not worries, but anxieties. Like when I would define that, like, and then I don't reach that, then I have this sense of, okay, then I'm not wealthy. So as long as I don't do that, you know, I'm kind of safe. But of course, it also prevents of um, getting bigger. So there, but there is a fear of becoming bigger, and that is also from somewhere. Uh, so every time when there's something like, okay, I have this and this goal or plan, then it's more like, oh, then it's like, okay, I'm afraid uh, because then I'm just like failing, and maybe it's still like the. Life is happening to me. 
Okay, okay. I haven't heard this from Dilt, Banla, or, or uh, any of the, the experts yet, yet, yet. I do believe there's something we need here. Uh, I believe we need something here that I believe we, I think we need something here. So once we feel this or that, once we feel any of them, I think we need something that will automatically, automatically make us feel good Make us feel good, make us feel great, and lead us back to creating more. Being what is often referred to as a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loop. So, look, whenever I get a paycheck or a bonus or some extra money, I feel great. I feel great, and then I'm looking to create more. Whenever stocks, things go up, whatever it is goes up, I feel, I feel wealthy. I look, how can I create more? Can you give me something which is internal and not external? Because when I lose my job, I'm depressed. So I, I just don't like this kind of like external acknowledgement or things. Great. And we should probably have external and internal that's x for examples but they're internal or intrinsic as well as extrinsic so let's say this is health health and before health i need to get the right fruit foods and vegetables in my fridge and for me when i'm making uh, vegetable juice i feel healthy when i make vegetable juice i feel healthy When I wake up in the morning and I've got great mobility and I'm doing yoga or stretching in the morning, you know, maybe maybe some big kick legs, you know, I'm feeling great. And that greatness for a lot of people that start yoga meditation, that leads to going off. You know, I've meditated, I've done yoga, I don't have to do anymore. But May I challenge you again? Can we do it on money or wealth? Can we not do it on health? Because I have the issue with money and wealth and not with health. <laughs> I want something intrinsic, which is like telling me why it's so great <laughs> intrinsically, <laughs> apart from paying the rent or apart from, I don't know. I'll let you speak to Darko. Um, or one of the coaches about that because I'm 10 minutes over time and we don't do overtime, remember? Well, we do, yes. we totally do, but we normally close on time. I'm surprised no one's jumped out. So we're 10 minutes past and I'm going to be here for another 10 minutes to answer and talk and maybe discuss and laugh. Um, normally we stop like 20 minutes ago and just have discussion, but I wanted to smash them out. And sorry, I was, yeah. So if anyone needs to go, do feel free to jump out. Thank you very much. We're going to stay here and chatter for maybe five or 10 minutes or so amongst us. I need to leave. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Darko. Thank you. Very beautiful information. Very useful information. Thank you. Mm. Look Thank deeper. You. Look deeper inside yourself or grab someone and ask them or connect with someone and have another discussion with them and have a discussion about whatever you think, because that'll help you go deeper. And guys, I can be completely wrong about some of this, so have a discussion with someone about it. Thank you, Adrian, it was great, really, thank yeah. you. Thank you much, it was really good. Cheers, Matthew. Thank you, Andrea. I got a lot of definitions to do though, redefine everything. Especially like uh, what you said is like wealth is healthy. So thank you. Thank you. I'm a hippie at heart, 100% hippie at heart. <laughs> I just wear a business shirt when, you know, on Mondays, Tuesdays, and occasionally Sunday, Sundays. Bye for now. Okay, see you later, Matthew. Okay, Yelena, I didn't quite fully understand your question. Should I pretend to? Goodbye. We wanted to say goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
So the, the thing is like um, having grown up in a rather uh, poor environment, um, I stopped very early to, to want things or need things or something, which is kind of cool as well. Um, the thing is like since last year, since the NLP course, <laughs> I was kind of questioning or the question in me came up. It's like, okay, do I not, uh, am I too afraid to dream bigger? Um, or uh, I mean, in, uh, my father always talked bad about rich, not bad about rich people, but rich people are not like the people who work basically hard, right? So I was growing up with a lot of value about like, you have to work to deserve. And I worked on these things like the last years and I, I overcame that. Uh, yeah, I think I overcame like I, when I see something and I like it, I buy it because I'm convinced I'm working for it anyway. I'm working hard all the time. So I don't need to deserve and uh, to reach a certain job to offer myself a certain kind of thing or something like that. This exchange trade thing. Uh, I grow out, grow out of that one. But what I mean is like, still, I think there's just way too much which is holding me back from. from Nations are different and peoples are different as well. I don't come from a, a rich area as well. In fact, I come from a bit of a ghetto in my area. But uh, I've got a couple of German friends here. <laughs> Thinking about two German girls, like, and, uh, you know, know each other very well for many, many years. And they have some kind of issues about money and not having money. And they're, they're very conservative and they, they've got some of the old programming. And one of them owns more property than I do. <laughs> but she still has the old programming. And uh, I, I got a mail one time. I can't remember what it was, but I was maybe I, I, was, I was using her apartment for a couple of months while she was away and I got all the mail and something happened. And I, and I think I found out or knew or saw or some of the, some of the, the, the mail were like contracts, settlement contracts for, you know, like, a unit she bought, you know, and it turns out she, she bought like two units in the complex, you know, and it was just like, <laughs> but the, the, the old programming is still there. So. But it's the content I'm talking about, you know, because I have the feeling I don't miss anything. Um, but then um, I wouldn't dare to, to want more or to, to, to chase more or to like, I would, when a person is, uh, when a client is coming to me and he's telling me like, okay, only this and this amount of money, I wouldn't do the job because I have my price. And even though I haven't worked for two months, I wouldn't consider to work undervalued. So, and, and then there are other people who think like, okay, I take as much possibilities and work as possible. It doesn't matter like uh, if I'm, I'm actually paid or not and if I'm totally exhausting. So for me, richness is more like time, having time than really chasing money. And so, so in this regards, I'm rich, but still, um, I, like um, I mean, I live in 30 square meters and I'm happy here. And, um, you know, of course, sometimes it's, it's a little bit like where I think like, okay, in winter to have a heating in a bathroom would be not too bad. Uh, why do I do that to me? <laughs> so, but um, um, apart from this, it's like, there is not this urge to really like become more rich, but then there is still like where I say like, I just like care to less actually maybe. I have nothing for me in my retirement yet. There's, there's, there's nothing. And um, hmm. so sometimes I feel I have just a little bit, I'm too relaxed and I don't know where I have the relaxedness from being a person who have begged for food as a child. <laughs> but like I yeah I don't know it's just like very interesting um, and I wouldn't say it's because I hate rich or something like that uh, I don't look up to rich I look, don't look down to rich I don't look down to that for me all people are the same 
doesn't matter what is their bank account or if it's like I don't know who the president you know it's like for me it's just like it's, it's, I, just, I just don't care about all these things but 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 yeah it would be nice to 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 it would be nice to have parents that don't need to care either but then it's their choice to struggle maybe I don't know it's just like it's their choice and to for me interesting. of course it's yeah sorry for me it's all a choice of course at one point you might not have any more the choice but uh, um, for me it's all I the But like, yeah, that's what I mean. I don't even, even struggle. I'm in my comfort zone, you know, and I'm not seriously growing. And that's the thing. It's just like, I'm in a comfort okay. zone. And maybe there's, this is, yeah. this is there's annoying. There's one I didn't share. There's one I didn't share. Actually, there's two. One of them is uh, something about comfort zone. I didn't ask because I thought you guys would be there. Uh, rich people constantly learn and grow. I learn and grow all the time. Keep learning and growing. Doesn't bring me into a bigger house or something. I might bring you more time. <laughs> We're not here to, to do coaching. We're not here to coach each other. We're just having a bit of a chit chat. If we had an outcome frame around this, if there was some kind of outcome frame where I wanted to something, something, or your land, I wanted to something, something, certainly, obviously we could coach on it. But the only outcome frame here is chit chat. And I'd like to encourage the outcome frame, Yolanda, of discussing more or, or going deeper inside yourself later with someone. That'd be great. And I like that you said that you're already rich. Like, I'm not sure if you said those exact words, but you feel rich. 30 meters. Yes, I have everything. Oh. I need. The thing is like, I'm, uh, the, the thing I consider is like, okay, because I experienced so less as a child, like I have different measurements, you know, of like richness. For me to have like a meal on my table is like, Hello, wow, something something to celebrate you know something to acknowledge and admire food so all these things they, they taught me like a lot of um i feel that richness but then when i compare me with others then it feels in that con social concept of richness you know it feels kind of a little bit ridiculous <laughs> And so I just need to see that I keep on con be connected with myself, it seems, rather than trying to compare uh, what is richness to, to society or I don't know. I wonder what would happen if all of us, if all of us completely cut the strings to our past. I mean, maybe, maybe it's a challenge to completely do it because, you know, as soon as we're born or even before we're born, we start getting things right. I wonder how it would be, thanks, Anya, if we all cut the strings to the past. Mm. How is it when the past is still living uh, <laughs> in Germany Footprints. and you have it like this in front of you? <laughs> what are you going to say, Michelle? Uh, you're on the edge there. I wonder how it would be if we all cut away the past, you know? It would be free to define life. But I am a big fan of define life on your own terms. And then when we say that because of law of comparison or whatnot, we still, well, what are our terms? Well, I, I want whatever we say is probably in relationship to our past. In our past, we saw someone, experienced something or whatever. I know, but me personally, I'm a big fan that you have a nest egg somewhere or you have a property or two somewhere so that if you ever have to, you know, retire or something happens, you'll be looked after. Yeah, I try to work towards that one, that's for sure. Yeah, I've 
hitchhiked around random countries. Uh, you know, I just had something come up about hitchhiking across Georgia with like hippies and I remember leaving hitchhiking at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I mean, who the hell hitchhikes at 3 p.m. in the afternoon? And they were like, trust, have faith in the journey, you know, and I got all that kind of rainbow serpent stuff. But in the back of my mind, you know, in the back of my mind, it's like, well, you know what? I, I would like to be financially secure if I go back home. I'd like to be able to choose when to go back home. I don't want to be able to not go home because I can't afford the ticket. So for me, it was freedom and flexibility was something I got from my past, a really high value for freedom and flexibility. And my value for freedom and flexibility is much higher than any desire to be rich, rich. I just want to be really free. So because I just want to have a, a, a much higher value for being free, I, I never went to multi millions because it is just too much. And my father, my father as an influencer, uh, my father just wanted to be free. So I think I got it from him. He just wanted to be free. I got freedom. Then when I got freedom, it's like, what next? Well, I just want freedom. <laughs>